Good. good. So good morning, everyone. Good morning, Doug. Uh, so today we'll move to uh, uh, chapter number six, or number five, sorry. So it is about factors affecting bond yields and the term structure of interest rates. So uh, one, uh, now we have uh, uh, already examined uh, the convexity concepts, uh, uh, the duration concepts. Uh, now we have learned that how to use them in order to compute uh, uh, the fair price of the bond or to forecast the future uh, change uh, in bond price whether in percentage or in dollars now let's move to uh, 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 the next concept which is very useful and uh, uh, often used by practitioners which is the yield curve right or uh, the term structure for interest rates so the point is that until now we have uh, uh, assumed that when we use the present value factors, we are keeping the discount rate constant through the whole life or the whole maturity of the bond, right? So we are using always the same discount rate or the same yield, the same yield to maturity uh, uh, for all the periods. So, for example, let's suppose we are dealing about uh, pricing a bond with a maturity of five years, right? Which is paying a semi-annual uh, uh, coupon. This means that we have to deal with 10 periods. Uh, what we are used to do is to use the same present value factor and the same discount rate for all you know, uh, the coupon payments that we are receiving plus the par value payment, which will occur at, by the end of the, uh, uh, of the maturity of the bond. Such an assumption is is you know uh, maybe we can consider it as a little bit simplistic right because it is very uh, uh, hard to believe that the yield to maturity will remain the same all over the maturity of the bond because the market is moving because there are a lot of you know a, a, a lot of events that can affect uh, uh, you know the yield to maturity uh, let's take an example, what we are living right now, right, with the coronavirus, uh, uh, you know, p pandemic, which is, you know, overflowing the world. Such events will affect the yields on the market. So we cannot suppose that the yield to maturity will remain constant all over the maturity of the bond. Now, an alternative solution would be to consider or to reconsider the yield to maturity for each period. So this means that we have to, uh, you know, imagine or we have to construct a relationship between the yield to maturity and the time to maturity. This means that every time you are going forward in the time, every time you are approaching or we are uh, coming closer to the maturity, we have to recalibrate we have to refresh our yield to maturity. So that's all about uh, this fifth chapter, right? How to construct or how to build uh, a relationship or a model between, you know, the yield to maturity and the time to maturity. That's why we call it the term structures, the term structure of interest rates. So, let me share the screen with you guys. So these are the learn objectives of our fifth chapter. So obviously we will not cover all you know, the topics on the fifth chapter. We we'll just cover, as you can see, the one highlighted. See, so after reading the chapter, you will understand why the yield on a treasury security is the base interest rate. So we'll see later what do we mean about by uh, base interest rate. Uh, understand also the factors that affect the yield spread between two bonds. What a yield curve is, uh, a spot rate and a spot rate curve, how theoretical spot rates are derived using arbitrage arguments from the treasury yield curve, and what the term structure of interest rate is and why the price of a treasury bond should be based on theoretical spot rates. So there is 
a lot of things that you have to learn during this chapter. And all of these you know, concepts are very useful for any practitioner in bonds, bonds market. So let's start by the first topic, which is the base interest rate. What do we mean about, uh, uh, you know, by, uh, what do we mean by base interest rates? So the securities issued by the U.S. Department of the Treasury are backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Consequently, historically, market participants throughout the world view them as having no credit risk, a view that has recently been challenged by, you know, uh, uh, several economic crises uh, that has, uh, you know, uh, hit the United States. But the thing is that overall, we consider uh, the securities issued by the U.S. government as risk-free securities, right? So we consider them as a reference for all the, the practitioners in the bonds market. So the minimum interest rate that investors want is referred to as the base interest rate or benchmark interest rate that investors will demand for investing in a non-treasury security. So this rate, which is the base interest rate, is the yield to maturity, hereafter referred to as simply yield, offered on a comparable maturity treasury security that was most recently issued, what we call also on the run. So when we say on the run bond, this means that the on the run bond is the most recent issue of bonds that the market has witnessed, right? Well, that's why we call it on the run. We have the off the run and on the run. In this chapter, we'll you know, uh, focus more on on the run issues because uh, they reflect you know, the most trendy you know, uh, uh, consideration in the market, right? So when we refer to the interest rate offered on a bond, we refer to that interest rate as the yield on the bond. So suppose that you are you know, uh, a conventional uh, uh, or a bond investor, right? And you are willing to invest some money or some of your wealth on a purchase some some bonds. When you will ask for a yield, or what, when you will assess the minimum yield you are asking for for this bond, you have all always to make the comparison between your bond or the bond you are interested in with a similar bond issued by the government or what you call the treasury bond. Right. When you do so, you are fixing the minimum, you know, yield you have to ask for. So when you are investing in a corporate bond, you will ask first for a minimum, what we call base interest rate. This base interest rate should be the yield offered by an equivalent. To, uh, you know, bond issued by the government. When we say equivalent bond, we mean by that a bond issued by the government, which uh, has the same characteristics than the co than the bond uh, issued by the corporate. Uh, same maturity, for example, same rating, right? Uh, 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 these, you know, factors will make, you know, two bonds considered as equivalent when they have the same maturity or uh, and the same, you know, uh, uh, the same rating. So this is the first step when you are, you know, willing to invest your money in the bond markets, you have to fix your base interest rate, which is once again, I repeat, the yield offered by an equivalent treasury bond, right? So... Doctor, yeah. the... Uh, if the same yield is offered by a corporate bond and a government bond, obviously no, the people buy not. government bonds. No, absolutely not. Them. Absolutely not. Uh, the yield offered by a corporate bond should always be higher than the yield offered by a government bond. But, uh, you know, the thing is that you have first to fix your base interest rate, right, which is the yield offered by the government bond, plus then you will add your risk premium. So this risk premium will depend on uh, uh, the risk uh, or, or, or how much risky is the corporate itself. But the thing is that 
the minimum that you cannot you know afford yourself to uh, uh, accept uh, uh, another yield lower than that the minimum should be equal to the yield offered by government bond right so yeah. actually, uh, uh, is that clear Shab? yes sir so the thing is that uh, think as uh, 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 think as if we are you're know, building a yield right or a, a, a required yield for the corporate bond when we are building something we should always start by the basement right so the basement in this case is the yield offered by an equivalent you know uh, 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 treasury bond because in all cases the corporate cannot be less risky than the government so the first step is to find your you know base interest rate this is the most important important thing once you got this you can add your risk premium now let's move to the benchmark spread so this is the difference between the yields of any two bonds is called a yield spread for example consider two bonds bond a and bond b so the yield spread is then see the yield on bond a minus the yield on bond b uh, uh, generally speaking we always use the governed bond as the yield on bond b so we are always trying to find the yield spread between the corporate bond and the government bond this yield spread uh, uh, will get higher if the investor considers that this corporate or this firm is a riskier right so uh, the yield spread can also be you know uh, 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 identified as the risk premium asked by any investors so here we have the u.s treasury security yields on february 26 for the year 2011 right so these are the US Treasury security yields. For example, we have here the maturity ranging from three months to 30 years. So when we have a maturity less than one year, we talk about a treasury bill. When we have a maturity more than one year, but less than 10 years, we talk about treasury note. When we have a maturity over than 10 years, we talk about treasury bond right so these are the three types of securities or fixed income securities issued by by the government in the u.s at least we have treasury bill less than one year a treasury note between one and ten years and finally we have the treasury bond over than ten years so you know such data is uh, you know easily observable uh, uh, on internet you can go to yahoofinance.com you can go to, to the Treasury uh, or the Federal Reserve, you know, site, and you will find all these, you know, these, uh, uh, these yields. So see, so the yields are ranging from 0.11% for a Treasury bill of three months until 4.50% for uh, a Treasury bond of 30 years of maturity. So the normal way that yields spreads are quoted is in terms of basis points, right? Uh, so the yield spread reflects the difference in the risks associated with the two bonds while we have formulated the yield spread in terms of individual bonds. We can also think of the yield spread for sectors of the bond market. So when bond B is a benchmark bond and bond A is a non-benchmark bond, the yield spread is referred to as benchmark spread. That is, the benchmark spread is equal to yield on non-benchmark bond minus the yield on benchmark bonds. So we are here considering two uh, you know, uh, uh, bonds belonging to two different you know, uh, sectors of the economy. So the benchmark spread reflects the compensation that the market is offering for bearing the risks associated with the non-benchmark bond that do not exist for the benchmark bond. So thus, the benchmark spread can be thought as, of, as risk premium. So suppose that we consider the U.S. securities or the government securities as the benchmark bond, right? So this is the U.S. securities, you know, benchmark, which is uh, uh, the risk-free securities. 
and we are trying to ask, to uh, to observe the difference of yields between let's say you know uh, uh, an industrial firm uh, you know issued bond so when we uh, compute the difference between the yield offered by this industrial company with the yield offered by the US treasury bond the difference is what we call the risk premium right also you know we can express the yield as a relative yield spread which is the yield on bond a minus the yield on bond b that's we are that's we are used to do then we divide by yield on bond b so it is in terms of percentage so when we use this one see we'll have the spread in terms of you know uh, 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 basis points while when we use the relative yield spread will have the spread in term of percentage. So let's do an example. So for example, on February 24th, 2011, the Goldman Sachs GP 3.65% coupon maturing in February 2016, which means that uh, it has five years of maturity, traded to yield 3.723%. So the 3.65% is the coupon rate while the 3.723% is the yield to maturity. So since this bond issue had five years to maturity, the appropriate treasury benchmark would be the five-year treasury yield. So we go back to the exhibit 5.1. So this is the five-year treasury security, which is offering 2.16% as an annual yield to maturity. See? so. So the benchmark here is the U.S. Treasury, right? With five year, you know, uh, 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 to maturity. So we have to consider a corporate bond with the same maturity, which we, which we can call an equivalent corporate bond, right? And uh, compute the difference of yields between these two, you know, bonds, or what you call, what you can call also the yield spread. So. The relative yield spread between Goldman Sachs and between, you know, uh, uh, the U.S. securities is equal to 3.723%, which is Goldman Sachs, you know, uh, yield minus 2.16%, which is the equivalent U.S. Treasury yield minus the U.S. Treasury yield equal to 72%. This means that the yield to maturity offered by Goldman Sachs is higher by 70%, 72%, sorry, compared to the US uh, or an equivalent US Treasury security. Now, the yield ratio also is equal to the yield on bond A, which is Goldman Sachs yield, divided by the yield on bond B, which is, you know, the US Treasury yield. So equal to 1.72. So this is the way uh, uh, we can compute the spread. So we have the spread in terms of basis points, by the spread, the relative spread, and we have the yield ratio. Okay, guys. So let's try to do an exercise. So exercise number one. So following our US Treasury, so it's number one, page 122. So following are U.S. Treasury benchmarks available on December 31 for the year 2007. So we have the U.S. Treasury, 3.125. So this is the coupon rate, and this is the maturity. So this bond should mature at the 30th of November, 2009. And this is the yield to maturity, right? 3.133. Then we have the one with a maturity 2012, then 2017, and 2037. Well, for, for each of these bonds, we are given the coupon rates as well as the yields to maturity. 
on the same day, the following trades were executed. So we have three corporate bonds. So on the left side, you have the US Treasury or the US, the US Treasury Securities, while on the uh, hand, uh, right hand side, we have a corporate you know, bonds. We have the Time Warner Cable, we have the McCormick and Co., and you have the Goldman Sachs Group, right? So this is, these are the issue, so the issuer, the issue, and the yield. So for Time Warner Cable, we have TWC offering 6.55% 6, 6 as a coupon rate and maturing at uh, 1st of May, 2037, and offering 6.373% as yield to maturity. Now the McCormick one, is offering 5.75% as a coupon rate, maturing at the 15th of December 2017, and offering 5.685% as a yield. And finally, the Goldman Sachs is offering 5.45% as a coupon rate, and is maturing at the 1st of November 2012, and is offering a yield to maturity equal to 4.773. So, uh, you are asked to complete the following table. So we have the issue, the yield. Now you have to find the corresponding treasury benchmark, the benchmark spread in terms of basis points, the relative yield spread, and the yield ratio. Okay, guys. So what would be your first steps? First, we will take the benchmark. Absolutely. So you have to identify the equivalent benchmark bond for each of these three corporate bonds, All right? When we say equivalent treasury bond, we mean a treasury security, which is maturing at the same date than the corporate bond. So I have here, See, three corporate bonds, and we have four U.S. Treasury securities. So we have to find which three out of these four U.S. Treasury, which three can be used as an equivalent bond for these corporate bonds. So let's start by the TWC, the Time Warner Cable. So which you know, U.S. Treasury uh, security can be considered as the equivalent for this corporate bond. The one that is maturing on 2037 with the yield of 4.518. Absolutely. So this one, see, the last one should be considered as the equivalent or the Treasury benchmark for the TWC bond. So we should put this one on the first row. Now for the McCormick and Co. The equivalent one should mature at 2017, which is this one. See? So the third one in Treasury benchmarks should be put in the second row. And finally, for Goldman Sachs, which is maturing at the 1st of November 2012, the second one. one. Okay, guys. Yes. Yes. So, once you have done this, what would be the next step? Find the benchmark spread. Absolutely. So, come on, please go on. Uh, I will give you, you know, a, a, a couple of minutes. Find me the benchmark spread in terms of basis points, the relative yield spread. And finally, the yield ratio. Okay.
the what's the how can I say it? The most benefit of the relative yield spread for investor. So the, how they will use it? Absolutely. Use the yield spread is a very good proxy for the uh, credit risk for you know uh, as a standard for the corporate. Our, no, no, it's not standard. It means that for each bond, you will have to compute uh, the risk premium. Okay. So the risk premium uh, reflects the credit risk or the default risk for this for this company, which means the risk that this company will be uh, in some times uh, or will be you know uh, uh, in the future uh, uh, in any point of the future will be unable to honor its obligations, unable to pay back. Uh, you know uh, the par value or unable to pay its coupon payments all right but the duration and convexity is not enough or good proxy for uh, As, so the duration and convexity are, are uh, or this one are, are used so, uh, are you to assess the volatility of the bond bond right they also they are also used yes. in order to uh, to forecast or to ex uh, you know to forecast the future price change of the bond right now in this uh, you know uh, uh, in this chapter we are looking after a new uh, challenge uh, uh, maybe because you uh, you were not here at the beginning of the lecture the thing here at Lazi is that we are trying to find another technique uh, in order to compute the fair price of the bond what we are used to do okay. uh, you know since uh, the last term when we have uh, seen uh, how to for, you know how to assess the bonds price in the investment course, and uh, during during this uh, uh, you know uh, uh, this course we have seen that we can use the present value technique in order to compute the bonds price, right? By using yes. this technique, we have, we have always assumed that the yield to maturity or discount rate used uh, in this technique is constant through the lifetime of the bond. Such an assumption is not realistic. So we cannot expect that the yield to maturity should remain constant for five, 10, 20, or 30 years. That, you know, it the not... investors will not take all these uh, proxies to find the, the uh, fair value of the, or the fair price for the point. Usually they will take just two or three which is uh, maybe the, the volatility, the duration, and uh, uh, the other one, with, what does it call? Uh, convexity. Convexity. Not convexity, sorry. Yeah, usually they will choose this one uh, of these proxies. So actually, actually, Abdaliz, uh, the convexity and uh, uh, you know, uh, the duration are mostly used in order to assess the, uh, the bond's volatility. Right. Okay. So they can also be used. Awesome. Can also be used to, to find the uh, uh, the fair price of the bond, right? But they are not very accurate, as we have seen last time. So this one is more accurate than Absolutely. convexity and duration. Uh -huh. uh, so this one, also called the term structure or the yield curve, can allow us to be more accurate in order to find the fair price of the bond. Okay. Got it. Thank okay. you so much, and sorry for this. Uh, so let's get back to course. Now we discuss the following factors that affect the benchmark spread for an issue, right? So we have the type of issuer, which means the quality or the credit quality of the company or the corporate that is issuing the bond, the perceived credit worthiness of the issue, uh, the term or maturity of the issue, the provisions that grant either the issuer or the investor the option to do something, which is, for example, the call, uh, the callable bond, the putable bond, we have seen you know, uh, uh, at the beginning of this course, uh, the taxability of the interest received. So we we'll skip this one because you know, uh, it is proper just to the US economy. Uh, the expected liquidity of the issue. So all these six uh, uh, factors will determine, uh, you know, the spread or uh, uh, the risk premium of each corporate. So first, the type of issuer. 
so if the issuer is a, a, a federal a, a, a federal government of agency or is this a governmental you know a, a, a agency this means that we can consider these securities issued by the government as risk free but if the issuer belongs to another sector like the industrial sector like the commercial sector like the financial sector this means that the issuer becomes more or becomes riskier compared to to the uh, to the benchmark which is the the government and every time the risk is increasing the spread is increasing too so the spread and the risk has a positive association uh, now the perceived credit worthiness of a sure so we we'll say so here we we'll talk about the default risk so which refers to the risk that the issuer of a bond may be unable to make timely principal and or interest payments. So most market participants reply, rely primarily on commercial rating companies to assess the default risk of an issuer. So uh, for, for, for the US market, for example, uh, uh, we rely mostly on you know, the ratings uh, uh, disclosed by uh, Sunder and Poor's, uh, by Fitch, uh, or by Moody's. So these are the three big companies uh, for, for ratings. Then you have the inclusion of options. So every time your, uh, the bond is offering more options for the investors, it is considered as less risky. Uh, for example, the global bond, it is uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very attractive for, for investors. So we skip this one taxability how they expected the liquidity of an issue, the financeability of an issue. So all of these one we have already you know, seen them during the first chapter, the term to maturity. So every time, so uh, gener generally, uh, we consider that the short, you know, uh, 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 or the shorter the, uh, uh, the bond maturity, uh, uh, the less is the risk and vice versa. Every time or the longer, the bonds maturity the higher is the risk now let's move to the uh, the most important point the term structure of interest rates so we start by the first concept which is the yield curve so the graphical depiction of the relationship between the yield on bonds of the same credit quality but different maturities is known as the yield curve so this is the first time that we are learning that for the same credit quality, the yield to maturity can vary in function or, or function, uh, you know, uh, 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 depending on the maturity or the time to maturity. So that's why we call it uh, uh, the term structure. So we're using the term of the bond or uh, the, the maturity of the bond, and we try to find a relationship between this maturity, this time to maturity, and the interest rates. And that, what, this is what, what we call the yield curve. So the exhibit 5.4 shows three typical shapes that have been observed for the yield curve. So the yield curve uh, can, uh, you know, uh, uh, can have uh, uh, three types of, of shape. Uh, and we have observed this type of shapes from the US market. So uh, these shapes are based on empirical observations. So daily yield curve information is available from a variety of sources on a real-time basis, the historical information about daily yield curves is obtained from 1990 onward from the US Department of the Treasury website. So see, so these are the three types of shapes for a yield curve. We can have the first type. So it will depend on, you know, on the economy. Uh, it will depend on, uh, you know, uh, on different factors, but uh, the empirical observations made on the U.S. market has, you know, uh, uh, has allowed us to find these three types of shapes. We can have a positive relationship, which means that every time the maturity is increasing, the yield offered by the bond is also increasing. We can ha also have the inverted relationship. When the maturity is increasing, the yield is decreasing. And we can have the flat one, which is that the yield remain constant independently of the maturity. And until now, we used this flat type. 
because we have always considered that the yield to maturity will remain constant all over the lifetime of the bond. Now we'll see that it's not true, or at least it's not always true. And the most common one are these two types of, you know, uh, uh, of shapes, especially, you know, uh, 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 who mo put more stress on the variability or the variation or the evolution of the yield to maturity, you know, uh, depending on the uh, evolution of uh, the, the time to maturity. So from practical viewpoint, as we explained earlier in this chapter, a key function of the treasury yield curve is to serve as a benchmark for pricing bonds and to set yields in all other sectors of the debt market, like bank loans, mortgages, uh, corporate debt, international bonds, and so on. However, market participants are coming to realize that the traditionally constructed treasury yield curve is an unsatisfactory measure of the relation between required yield and maturity. But the key reason is that securities with the same maturity may actually carry different yields. So as we explain in the next section, this phenomenon reflects the role and impact of differences in the bond's coupon rates. So now why the yield curve should not be used to price a bond? So the price of a bond is the present value of its cash flow, right? However, in our illustrations, and our discussion of the pricing of a bond in chapter two, we assume that one interest rate should be used to discount all the bond's cash flows. So the appropriate interest rate is the yield on a treasury security with the same maturity as the bond plus the appropriate risk premium. So that's the way uh, we have done things until now. Now let's consider the following two hypothetical five-year treasury bonds, A and B. The difference between these two treasury bonds is the coupon rate which is 12% for A and 3% for B. So the cash flow for these two bonds per $100 of par value for the 10 six months period to maturity would be, <coughs> so, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so for both A and B, uh, uh, they have five years to maturity and because they are paying some annual uh, coupon, so we will, uh, you know, uh, convert this maturity from uh, yearly to semi-annual, you know, periods. So we'll have 10, six months period. So we, from the period one to nine, we will just receive the coupon payments, right? While for the final period, we receive the coupon payment plus the par value. So for bond A, A is offering uh, remember, 12% per year, which means that we, he will offer 6% as a coupon rate for, uh, 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 or on a semi-annual basis. So 12% divided by two times, you know, 100 it is equal to $6. While for B, B is offering 3% as annual, you know, interest rate. When we convert this in, the annual interest rate into semi-annual interest rate, we'll get 1.5% times 100 equal to $1.5. So these are different cash flows, expected cash flows for both A and B. So instead, each cash flow should be discounted at a unique interest rate that is appropriate for the time period. So what we, uh, uh, you know, uh, what you have done until now is to find or to pick up one discount rate, right? And use it for all these future cash flows in order to find the fair price of both A and B. So we used the same discount rate for period one, for period two, three, four, five, until the 10th period. So this is a simplistic, a very simplistic assumption. Now we are trying to, uh, 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 to have a more accurate, you know, uh, 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 results. So we'll try to find or to identify for each of these 10 periods a specific or a unique yield to maturity. So the correct way to think about bonds A and B is not as bonds, but as package of cash flows. Now, the most uh, difficult part in this, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, this, uh, in this chapter is how to find the good yield to maturity for each period, right? So as if we are, you know, dividing the bond into, you know, uh, uh, multiple periods, or, or as if we are, uh, you know, uh, uh, trimming the bonds into, you know, uh, uh, sub bonds. I'll give you an example. So just let me move to the, the board. So is the board clear enough for you guys? A little bit, doctor, but uh, maybe could we could we use the words for or it's not not available? I mean, as a chart. So let me just. Uh, maybe try to zoom. What about now? Yes, it's clear. Good. So this is the timeline for for the bond A, right? So the bond A has a maturity of five years, which can be converted into 10 periods using the semi-annual basis. So we have the first period, second, third, fourth, and the reaching the final one. So for the bond A, we are receiving, you know, uh, cash flows regularly from period one to nine. The bond is distributing just coupon payments equal to six. So this six is equal to the par value times the annual interest rates divided by two. Now for the final period, we receive the par value plus the coupon payment, all right? Now, uh, since the beginning of this course, when we were asked to compute the, uh, you know, uh, the third price of the bonds, we used to, uh, you know, to consider the same discount rate for all these, you know, these cash, cash flows, right? So, Suppose that this count rate or the yield or equal to 7%. So this is to maturity. We considered, we have considered that this 7% is available for the cash flow that, we, uh, that uh, uh, will, uh, will be received after six months, after one year, after one half a year, and so on. So such an assumption is not realistic and uh, makes our you know uh, uh, calculus not very accurate so in order to find the solution to this problem we have assumed that from now on we'll consider a different yield to maturity for each you know period so for this one for a period of six months we will use a yield, uh, y1 which is the first year to maturity now for the second one, in order to discount, say the second cash flows, we use a different yield to maturity, Y2. And same thing for the Y3, and so on. I hope the idea is clear, guys. Yes. Now the problem, how could we find the appropriate yield to maturity, yields to maturity for each one of these 10 periods? So actually, the new formula would be as follows. The new fair price of the bond at T0 
would be equal to 6, which is C, the first cash flow, divided by 1 plus Y1 power 1, plus 6 divided by 1 plus now. Y2 is a different year to maturity, power 2, power 3, and so on, and to reaching the ninth period, and then finally the tenth period. Sorry, 9, 1, 9, Y9, nine, Y10. Nine, Y3, this one. So we have to find 10 different yields to maturity and then apply these 10 different yields to maturity in the present value model to find the good, you know, uh, 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 fair price of the bond. And once we have to find this fair price, we can undertake our investment decision. We can buy this bond or sell it. Depends on the fact uh, if this bond it is overpriced or underpriced. But now the first or most challenge is to find these different yields maturity. So this is what's called the yield curve, because we are associating one yield to every maturity. One why one when we have a maturity of half a year. Why two when we have a maturity of one year. Why do you have a maturity of one and a half years and so on? So once again, as if guys, as if we are dividing the bonds into 10 different bonds. The first one is maturing after six months and paying one coupon. Now the second one is maturing after one year. The third one is maturing after three years, right? But yeah. you have to pay attention. So this one is paying the, the first coupon after one period, right? Now the yes. second one, when you consider the second one, you consider as if it is not paying any, it's not paying, you know, cash flows here. Because yeah. the first one was considered, was uh, taken, was, taken into account with the first, you know, first bond. So as if we are transforming the graph into the following form. So we have, so we'll, I will, you know, rewrite this graph or represent this graph in a, in a different manner. So as if we have, I have a first bond from T0 to T1, paying $6. And then we have a second bond paying nothing here and paying six, sorry, T, T2. And then we have a third bond, T0, Sorry, T1, T2, and T3. Paying zero here, zero, and six here, and so on. So every time I'm adding a new coupon payment, right? Yes. These are considered as being what we call zero coupon treasury. Because, see, they are paying coupon just by the end of the maturity. So they are paying maturity. But they are paying the only coupon they are paid is at the maturity. Same thing here. They are paying the coupon payments at the maturity, right? So this is what you call the zero coupon. The zero coupon security or treasury. Okay guys. Yes. So as if the, the corporate bond, this corporate bond, can be divided into 10 zero coupon bonds. So we, I, I'm just dividing this coupon 
and to 10 zero coupon bonds. This will allow me afterward, as we will see later, so this will uh, allow me to find, you know, uh, the required yield to maturity for each period. So I'm treating this one as, it, as if it was a separate, you know, yield to maturity, then I will be able to find the first yield to maturity, and the second one, I will be able to find the Y2, the Y3, and so on. Once we have, you know, determined the different yields to maturity, once we have a list of 10 yields to maturity, I can use them back into the, the initial formula and find the fair price of the bond day. So it is a long process, but it worth it because once we have done, once we, once we have found the yield curve, which is the association between each yield and you know the uh, the maturity. Once we have done, uh, once we, once we have built this yield curve, it will allow me to 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 have a more accurate you know uh, 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 estimation for the fair price of the bond. Okay, so so the correct way to think about bonds A and B is not as bonds, but as packages of cash flows. So more specifically, they are packages of zero coupon instruments, as you know, uh, as I have, as I showed you. So they are packages of zero coupon instruments. Thus, the interest earned is the difference between the maturity value and the price paid at T0. So obviously, in the case of each coupon bond A or B, the value of pr or price of the bond is equal to the total value of its component zero coupon instruments. So in general, any bond can be viewed as a package of zero coupon instruments, that is, each zero coupon instrument in the package has a maturity equal to its coupon payment date, or in the case of the, uh, the principal, the maturity date. So the value of the bond should equal to the value of all the components zero coupon instruments. Now to determine the value of each zero coupon instrument, it is necessary to know the yield on a zero coupon treasury with that same maturity. Uh, this yield is called the spot rate. So for this example, for B, A and B, we have 10 spot rates, which means that for each maturity, you have to find the equivalent yield or the equivalent uh, you know, uh, uh, base interest rate on an equivalent treasury, uh, 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 treasury securities. For example, when we have, uh, for the first term, it is six months, right? So we have to find, to identify the treasury bill expiring in six months, right? Then you have to find the, uh, you know, the yield to maturity offered by this treasury bills, and this would be the spot rate for the first period, and so on. So rather it is, uh, so because there are no zero coupon treasury debt issues with a maturity greater than one year, it is not possible to construct such a curve solely from observations. So the thing is, or the problem is, the real challenge is that we cannot observe in the market uh, zero coupon instruments for more than one year. Because uh, remember for this, you know, uh, for, uh, uh, for the example of A and B, we have assumed that we will, you know, divide these bonds A and B into a, packages, a package of small zero coupon instruments, right? Now, the good thing is that we can observe equivalent treasuries, securities offering uh, uh, or equivalent zero coupon treasury instruments for six months and one year because these treasury bills are zero coupon instruments. So uh, we don't worry, we don't have to worry for, uh, for, you know, for uh, maturities under than one year. Now, if the maturities becomes 
higher than one year, we can no longer observe zero, or we can no longer find, uh, you know, zero coupon uh, uh, security instruments offered by the government. All the security, all the all the uh, uh, treasury securities offered by the government, more for more for more uh, than one year, they are paying, you know, coupon payments regularly. So this is the real problem. How to find the spot rate for, you know, uh, uh, for uh, maturities more than one year. So because there are non, no zero coupon treasury debt issues with a maturity greater than one year, it's not possible to construct such a curve solely from the observations of the market activity on treasury securities. Rather, it, it is necessary to derive this curve from theoretical considerations as applied to the yields of the actual actual tre treasury debt security, such as such, such a curve, sorry, is called a theoretical spot rate curve. So we have the spot rate, then we have the theoretical spot rate curve, and is a graphical depiction of the term structure of interest rates. So the theoretical spot rate curve is the graphical depiction of the term structure interest rate. So uh, let's find how uh, you know we can uh, apply these theoretical concepts uh, uh, on uh, you know on the ground let's see how to construct the theoretical spot rate curve for treasuries so we have different you know uh, uh, methods to do so as the on the run treasury issues of the on the run treasury issues and selected off the run we have all treasury coupon securities and bills and we have the treasury coupon slips so we'll just use the first one which is the on the run Treasury issues. So the on the run, yes, please. Sorry for this review. What uh, um, usually the interest rate is uh, has different uh, rate mm -hmm. for even for each uh, day, not for a uh, year. So uh, yes. most of the bonds will change in the price. Uh, will change. We have a change in, in their prices. Mm -hmm. Uh, even if it's uh, callable or not callable, or any mm -hmm. uh, kind of bond. Mm -hmm. So how we could find the, it, it would be theoretical without any even uh, clause to write. As we see in the last uh, week, the interest rate going to, uh, it's become a zero. Rate. Yes. yes. No. So in this uh, case, what we should, uh, how can, even if we find it, uh, find the yield or the theoretical spot, mm -hmm. it will not be even uh, close to uh, the the right rate. What? So my question, uh, I I think uh, actually actually maybe, that is, uh, uh, I, I think you know I understand the question. Actually, the yield curve is not constant. You have to recalibrate the yield curve daily. So every time the, the the you know the interest rates are changing, as if as it is the case right now, you have to recalibrate your yield curve daily on a daily basis. So you have to take. You mean as an investor? Yes, absolutely. As an investor, is actually you, know, you you don't have to do it by yourself because there are some softwares that are uh, that will extract your know, data from the financial markets and it will calculate you know, automatically you know uh, the yield curve for you. Yeah, but I cannot predict. You know, it's suddenly become the interest rate become a zero. Even if I uh, account it for one, two, three times, it will not be beneficial because I, it will it will it will be changed, and not all the bonds uh, could be uh, sell and uh, buy. Absolutely. I mean, it's not so you don't have to predict, right? You don't have to predict. You are just considering the observed rates on the market all right so uh, until now we are not predicting we are just considering the observed rates on the market okay for example I, uh, uh, I thought you didn't find that you, you said we will find the best uh, or the most uh, uh, accurate efficient for each year the most uh, the most accurate or the most. Absolutely. Uh, I, I told you. I told you. For each year. 
Yes. So I, if you cannot find it without predict. No, no. I told you we are looking for calculating the most accurate fair price of the bond right now at year zero. Then compare it to the okay. observed, you know, bonds price on the market, and then undertake, you know, uh, the most efficient uh, decision. Right. So we will uh, choose by uh, observing the market. Absolutely. Not by predict. Absolutely. So we just you know compute the fair price, compare it to the observed price, and then you know uh, uh, identify if this security of this bond is overpriced or underpriced. And we will find the fair uh, price by mm -hmm. the benchmark, not with the convexity and absolutely, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. good. Okay. So because so we are you know we are uh, uh, make some evolution our you know way to to you know to consider consider bonds. First, we have started by using the present value technique, using a constant, you know, uh, uh, constant yield to maturity, and we have seen that such a technique has, you know, a big gap or big shortage, which is that we cannot consider that the yield to maturity will remain the same all over the lifetime of the bond. Then we have used the duration and convexity, and we have seen that these two concepts can be very useful in assessing the uh, bonds volatility but they are but they are not very accurate sorry in order to for, uh, to find the fair price of the bond right because of the convexity yes. form of the curve now we are using a different technique which should be more accurate than the previous ones because for this technique we are using the present value you know uh, 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 method plus we are recalibrating our you know uh, 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 our yields depending on uh, the periods so we are using what we call the yield curve right yes now we are trying to find so uh, as i told you the key the key you know uh, thing is that we have to uh, 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 to re-represent or to uh, uh, to uh, uh, trim or to divide the bond into a package of zero coupon instruments right for each zero coupon instruments you have to find the right corresponding yield now the good thing that so there's a good thing and a bad thing with such a technique the good thing is that for you know uh, uh, maturities less than one year you can directly observe the yield to maturity on the market because uh, we have treasury bills with three months, six months, nine months, and one year of maturity. So these are already observed, you know, uh, treasuries. So we have just to go to the market. We have to, uh, you know, to pick up uh, the required yield to maturity and consider them as the, sp as the right spot rates. Now the problem is, so the, uh, you know, the bad things is that for maturities more than one year, we cannot absolutely there is no there is no zero coupon instrument offered by by the government all the uh, you know uh, uh, the treasury securities for more than one year are offering a regular coupon payments yes so we have to find a way to you know uh, 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 to compute what you call the theoretical spot spot rate so we have the observed spot rate for less than one year and now you have to compute the theoretical ones for more than one year so let's see how we can do it doctor but uh, for for one year what's the the equation or what's the formula of this uh, uh, for, for, but, so for uh, for uh, maturity of one year you mean yeah we will take it now just to take uh, just to consider a treasury bill right with the net has yes. yes treasury bill yeah. and so these are observed on the market so a treasury bill is you know uh, short term debt securities issued by the government and it is also a zero coupon uh, you know a zero coupon securities so we have just to go to the market observe the yield to maturity offered by a treasury bill of one year and this yield to maturity will, will be considered as you know the spot rate for a maturity of one year okay Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so the goal is to construct a theoretical spot rate curve with 60 semi-annual spot rates. 
60 because you know uh, the most uh, or the uh, the longest you know uh, maturity is equal to 30 years so 30 times 2 which is 2 semester per year is equal to 30 semi annual spot rates ranging from the 6 month rate to a 30 year rate excluding the 3 month bill there are only 8 maturity points available when only on the run issues are used so because see the on the run treasury issue guys are generally for these you know for these maturities they are for three months six months one year treasury bills then we have two year three year five year and seven year and then seven and ten years treasury notes and we have a 30 year treasury bond okay so these are the only uh, you know securities or debt securities issued by the government in the u.s at least we have uh, uh you know um, three types of treasury bills we have three months six months one year so we are we are not interested in six months because our bond is paying you know semi-annually uh, semi-annual semi coupon payments so we are interested in six months and one year treasury bills okay then we have the treasury notes and they have maturity of uh, uh, two years, three, five, seven, and 10 years. So these are the maturities for the treasury notes. And finally, we have a 30 year maturity for the treasury bond, right? So as you can see here, we have, uh, so the observed one, we have eight maturity points available observe it eight maturities right when only the run issues are used so the 52 missing remember we are we need 60 semi annual spot rates and we have just eight available so the 60 the 52 missing maturity points are interpolated from the surrounding maturity points on the bar yield curve so the simplest interpolation method and the one most commonly used is the linear, the linear inter extrapolation specifically given the yield on Par, the par coupon curve as at two maturity points the following is calculated so we have to consider the yield at higher maturity so remember we have so so let's go to the board This is the time, and this is the yield. So we are trying to construct the yield curve, which is you know graphical depiction of the variation of the yield function of of the time, right? So we have to find the right value of the yield for sixty p's. We have thirty years as a maximum. So we have here. T1, this is the first semester, or one half year. Two is for one year. Three is for one year and a half, and so on, and reaching P60. So among these 60 points, we have eight observable points. They are, they are, they are already observable. We have for T1, which is the treasury bill for six months. We have 42, which is a treasury bill for one year. We have also T4, T6, T10, T14, T20 and T60. So we have 1 1.2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So when 
for this two one. So we can obtain them from the treasury treasury bills. For this one, it is a treasury note with two years of maturity. Three years, five, seven, and ten years. So these one are for the treasury notes. These one are for the treasury bills. And this is last one. Last one for the treasury bond. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, I said I'm um, uh, just saying with you, T bills and T uh, bonds. So the problem is resolved for this, for just for this three, eight points because they are already observed. Now the problem is with the remaining 52 points. How to find the good or the appropriate yield to maturity for the remaining 52 points? So we use the ex the linear extrapolation. You know, method. For example, suppose that you know uh, we are looking to find the right yield to maturity for you know uh, for maturity ranging from uh, let's say uh, three to five years, right? So we already have the yield to maturity for T six and T ten. These two are already observed on the market. Now, the challenge is to find the yield to maturity for T7, T8, and T9. So for this one is for three years and five years. All you have to do is to find the yield to maturity for five years minus the year to maturity for three years, and you have to divide it by the number of periods between these two dates, which is one, two, three, four periods. So let's see an example. See, so this is the formula. You have to, to consider the yield at higher maturity minus the yield at lower maturity divided by the number of semi-annual periods between the two maturities, points plus, plus one. Now, for example, suppose that the yield from the par yield curve for the two year and five year on the run issues is 6% and 6.6%. See? So 6% for two year, 6.6% for five year, respectively. So this, there are five semi-annual periods between these two maturity points. Because for two years we have T4, while for five years we have T10. So the difference is between no, 10 minus four is equal to Okay, equal to five. So the extrapolated yield for the two, 2.5, three, 3.5, and four, uh, 4.5 maturity points is found as follows. So I have to compute the yield at the higher maturity, which is for five years. It is 6.6% minus the yield to maturity for, say for two years, 6% divided by the number of periods, so my annual periods between these two days, which is five plus one, so six, equal to zero, 10%. This means that when you are moving from one period to another, you have to add 0.10% in the yield to maturity. So since the starting point is 6% for two years, when we move to the 2.5 year yield, you have to consider the initial yield to maturity plus 0.1. So it becomes 6.1%. Now, when you want to, uh, you know, uh, or, or you, when you 
want to co compute the three year yield, you have to consider the previous one, 2.5 plus 0.1%. So every time you are you know, uh, uh, adding a new, uh, uh, or uh, uh, a new period, you have also to add 0.1% in the yield. Okay, guys? Yes. Yes, doctor. Okay, so uh, maybe we should take uh, 10 minutes uh, break, then we should resume. Okay, guys? Okay. So, Let's resume. So let's get back to uh, the textbook. So this is the way we can compute the unobserved, you know, uh, uh, yield to maturity for the intermediary points, right? So we have 52 points to fill uh, using this uh, uh, extrapol linear extrapolation technique. Now the exhibit 5.5, 5, uh, 5. so uh, we'll summarize the maturity and yield to maturity for 20 hypothetical treasury securities, right? So uh, here we are dealing about not spot rate, but hypothetical spot rate, right? So we have a period ranging from one to 20, which means that uh, uh, we are dealing with a bond with uh, 10 year maturity. So then, so these are the period using uh, the, the semi-annual basis, and these are the years, all right? So when we have one period, this means that we are, this is for one half year, six months. When we have three periods, it is for one and a half year, and so on. Then we have the yield to maturity coupon rate in terms of percentage. So see, here we are considering as if all these bonds are par value bonds, which means that the yield to maturity is equal to the coupon rate, right? So for so this is, this is a, a very important assumption when we are computing the hypothetical spot rate, we have to uh, assume that all these, you know, uh, uh, zero coupon instruments are what we call a par value, which means that the coupon rate is equal to the yield to maturity for each of these, you know, uh, 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 treasury securities. So. The yield is ranging from 5.25 percent for six months until 6.8 percent for uh, 10 years. Now let's look how the par yield curve is converted into the theoretical spot rate curve using what we call the bootstrapping technique. It's a very common and very you know uh, famous technique used in, uh, by you know uh, by bonds practitioners called the bootstrapping technique. So for simplicity, we will illustrate this methodology to calculate the theoretical spot rate curve for only 10 years. So we can uh, expand this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a time until 30 years. So that is 20 semi-annual spot rates will be computed. Suppose now that the par yield curve is the one shown in exhibit 5.5. So this is the par yield curve. So we have to use this one in order to find, you know, the 20th hypothetical, hypothetical spot rate. So to explain the process of estimating the theoretical spot rate curve from observed yields on treasury securities, we use the data for the price, annualized yield, and maturity for the 20 hypothetical treasury securities shown in exhibit 5.5. Its security is assumed to have a marked price equal to its par value, so that the yield to maturity and the coupon rate are equal. Now, consider the six month treasury bill in exhibit 5.5. As explained in chapter six, so we'll see later, a treasury bill is a zero coupon instrument, which means that it will uh, uh, pay or the, the coupon payment is the difference between the par value and, you know, uh, uh, and the price paid at T at zero. Uh, okay, so hence its annualized yield of 5.25% is equal to the spot rate. Similarly, for the one year treasury, the cited yield of 5.5% is also the spot rate because remember we have uh, already established that for six months and for one year, the zero coupon instrument is already done, uh, is already observed in the market. So no need to, to compute the spot rate. 
So just to consider the observed one and you know, uh, use it as a spot rate. So given these two spot rates, we can compute the spot rate for a theoretical 1.5 year zero coupon. Now this is the problem. So see, through all these periods, right, we have just two observed zero coupon instruments for just period one and two. All the remaining ones, for all the remaining ones, we do not have, you know, zero coupon instruments. So you, we have to compute, uh, you know, uh, uh, the theoretical spot rates. So let's start by the period number three, which corresponds to 1.5 years. Now, the price of theoretical 1.5 year zero coupon treasury should equal the present value of three cash flows from an actual 1.5 year coupon treasury, where the yield used for discounting is the spot rate corresponding to the cash flow. So now we are, con we are trying to consider, uh, you know, a separate, you know, bond uh, uh, or separate treasury securities uh, maturing in one and a half year, right? So we are, we'll just consider this line, right? So we will not consider the following one as if we have just one security, see, maturing in one and a half year. So we'll use the present value technique. So the fair price of such a security, see, maturing after one and a half year is equal to the present value of its expected future cash flows. Now, the only difference is we used to, uh, you know, to uh, consider one fixed discount rate for all the periods. Now we'll consider a different yield or a different discount rate for each period. So have three periods, remember, have because uh, the bond will mature after one and a half year, so we have three periods. So the treasury where the yield used for discounting is the spot rate corresponding to the cash flow. The exhibit 5.5 shows the coupon rate for a one and a half year treasury as 5.75% using $100 as par and the, ca uh, the cash flow for the treasury security is. So we receive one cash flow after six months, Two cash, the second cash flow will be received after one year, and the third one will be received at the maturity. All right. Now, this is the coupon rate. Because remember, we are considering a par value bond, which means that the, the yield to maturity is the same as the coupon rate. So, see, so for the first period, this treasury security will pay $100 time. See? The coupon rate, which is 0 0.0575 times 0 0.5 because we are dealing uh, about semi-annual basis. So we receive 2.875 after six months. Same thing after one year. And we receive, you know, the coupon payment plus the par value at the end of uh, the maturity of this bond. Now the present value, see, now we'll, we'll use a different discount rate for each cash flows. So Z1 for the first cash flow, Z2 squared for the second cash flow, Z3 power three for the third cash flow, right? So the Z1 is the spot rate for six months, which is already observed. Now, the Z2 is the spot rate for period two, which is also observed. Now, the unobserved discount rate or the spot rate is for Z3. So this is the unknown variable that you are looking for. I don't know if you, if you are following or not, because I, I know it's, uh, it's a little no. complicated, right? Because the, the most complicated thing here is that you have to distinguish to the different concepts. 
between spot rate, between yield to maturity, and between coupon rate, right? And between theoretical spot rate. So we have four, you know, concepts, right? So when we say coupon rate, so this is the nominal or the facial, you know, uh, uh, rate paid by uh, by uh, by the by the bond, right? It is constant. So this is the coupon rate. Whereas then we have the yield to maturity, which is uh, you know uh, uh, the rate of return required by investors. Now, when we are dealing with par value bonds, this means that the yield to maturity should be equal to the coupon rate, right? So this is a good thing. So when we are building our yield uh, uh, curve, we should just consider a par value, par value bonds. So every time we are considering a bond, the coupon rate is equal to the yield to maturity. Now the spot rate. So the spot rate is the yield to maturity offered by zero coupon instrument for a given period. Now for these spot rates, we can have, uh, or we are dealing, we can have something like, you know, 60 spot rates because we have uh, uh, the longest maturity is for 30 years, right? Among these 60 periods, we can just observe the spot rates for two periods, for six months and for one, year. for one year, right? Now for the remaining one, we should compute what we call the theoretical spot rate. Yes. Okay, that's, that's what we are doing right now. So we are considering, so see, so for one and two, these two, see, the first two rows, these are the spot rates. For all the remaining ones, we should compute, you know, the theoretical spot rate. Now, we are trying to find the spot rate for the period number three. And we should, you know, proceed as follow. We have to choose the we have to take the equation and apply it with numbers. Absolutely. So. So we are trying to find the Z3, which is the spot rate for the period number number three. In order to do so, we have first to uh, you know to find uh, or to uh, uh, to use the present value technique, which is we should consider uh, you know uh, uh, a securities maturing in three years, right? So in three periods, so T1. T2 and T3. So we already know the spot rates for one and two because they are already observable. Now we are computing the theoretical spot rate for the period number three or one and a half year. So we already know that the current price of such security is equal to $100 because we have assumed that all these securities are par value, right? $100. So, by applying the present value technique, the current price should be equal to the, to the present value, value of the future cash flows, right? Yeah. So, the cash flow one divided by, see, now we no longer use the same discount rate for all the cash flows. For the first one, we use Z1, which is the spot rate, power one, plus cash flow two, one plus Z2. Power two, so, so the Z is the Y, right? The, the, the yield plus the cash flow three, one plus Z three power three. Now we have to identify first the three cash flows. For the first year, 
So sorry, for the first period, we just received the coupon payments, all right? So it will be equal to the par value times the coupon rate. So how much is the coupon rate for the period number four uh, or four for the security? So we have to go back to the, uh, you know, to the exhibit 5.5 because it summarizes the coupon rates for all the maturities. And so we should go back to the exhibit 5.5 page. 103, see? So the coupon rate is equal to 5.75% per, per year. So 100 times 5.75% divided by two because we are dealing on a semi-annual basis. Then for the cash rule number two, same thing. It will just pay coupon payments divided times sorry now for the final cash flow we will receive an addition the power value itself so it is equal to 100 5.75 percent plus the final final value so for the first one, it is equal to, let me check. 5.25? 2. 2.875. Oh, yeah. Because we have divided by two. This one is the annual interest rate. Ah, uh, okay, yes. So 2.875. 2 and for the final one, 102. 8.75. So these are the three cash flows for this security. Now, I just to replace it here, this formula. So 2.875, 102, 8.75. We already know the Z1 and the Z2 because these two spot rates are and the same, same time observed. Observe. So as they are at the same time, the coupon rate for the period one and two. So we should once again go back to the exhibit 5.5. So these are 5.25 on annual basis. See? And 5.5%. Fourth year? No, not fourth year. Period one and two. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. But don't forget, these are annual, annual base, annual rates. So you have to, you have to convert you it. Divide by two. Absolutely. So Z1, is equal to 5.25% divided by two. while the Z2 is equal to 5.5% divided by two. So 5.25 divided by two, 2.625%, while the other one is 2.75%, right? So we just, now we'll just replace the Z1 and Z2 by these respective values. We already know the current price, the different cash flows, so the only unknown variable is Z3. So it would be very easy now to find the Z3, which is the theoretical spot price, uh, spot rate, sorry, for the third period. So all I have is to replace Z1 and Z2 by these respective values. So 1.02625 power one of a second one. 10275 power two. So 
let's compute this expression. So 1.02625 plus 0.275 power These two together is equal to 5.525. So 100 minus 5.525 is equal to 102.875 divided by. One plus Z three power three. First one is ninety four point four seven five. have 94.475 equal to 102, 8, 7, 5 divided by 1 plus Z3 power 3. So this means that 1 plus Z3 power 3 is equal to 94, 475. Zero point nine one eight three. So Z three is equal zero point no, sorry this one the inverse one hundred and two eight seventy five divided by Ninety four, four, seventy five divided by one point zero eight. Minus one equal to zero point zero two eight eight, so two point eighty eight percent. So this is the spot rate for you know on semi on semi annual basis for the period number three. So now if you want to find the annual one, I just multiply by two, and that's it. So 2.88 times 2, 5.76%. So this is the theoretical spot rate for period number three. Okay, guys? Yes, doctor. So, doctor, now, yes. Could we have uh, a summarize of all these questions to find the spot of the third year or not? Uh, if you don't mind. Uh, Maybe as a word file. No, actually, actually like that is there is no you know uh, 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 there is no formula because you have to adapt yourself uh, with the different variables that you can have for each exercise. We we'll see later we have another exercise with different data. Uh -huh, okay. So we we'll okay. see. So we don't have a standard you know uh, formula for uh, all the periods. So you have to adapt yourself. Depends on the situation. Right, but. Uh, the bootstrapping technique will, uh, you know, we use the same steps, right? First, you have to build the exhibit 
which yeah. is, uh, you know, which is uh, uh, often observed uh, in the market, you, right? It's yeah. For rates, sorry, it's for uh, coupon rates and uh, yield to maturity. Uh, then once you, you, you have this exhibit uh, for the first and second period, which is T1 and T2, these are the observable ones. This means that these rates will correspond to the spot rates, right? Now for the remaining one, for the following one, from three, for, from the period three uh, to the period 60, all these one, you have to compute the theoretical spot price using the same technique, this technique. Now, I will ask you to find now the theoretical spot rate for the period number four. So the answer is already given in the textbook, but I, I, I'm, you know, uh, I want to, I want to do it by yourself, right? Find the Z4, the spot rate for the period number four. So now we have spot rates for one and two, they are observed, and the spot rates for three, which is theoretical. Now we will build the following points. Now let's move to the uh, uh, period number four. What would be the required steps to find the Z4? We have to find the uh, uh, present value, or we have to find the Z before anything. Uh, I will check. Uh, then we would find the present value. Sorry. I will say we know that the, uh, the you know. The security for with the maturity equal to four is also a par value, right? which means that yes. the current price is equal to the par value, which is equal to one hundred dollars. Yeah. You have, first, you have to identify the cash flows for the year or for for the period one, two, three, and four. What's the first step? Find the cash flows for the period one to four. Then, once you have found these cash flows, you will use you know, uh, uh, the equation, which is par value equal to the present value of the future cash flows. Yes. And you will use okay. Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. Now, the good thing, we already know the Z1, Z2, and Z3. Now, yeah, about we have to find the one, Z, one plus Z4. Doctor, we will account as uh, semi-annual, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. So all, all the cash flows are semi-annual. But then we'll convert the Z4 from semi-annual basis into annual basis. And Multiply two. Double that. OK.
Doctor, it's uh, mm. one point zero three zero zero nine. One point zero three zero zero nine. This is for what? The Z four. Oh, we can't we can't have a Z four more than one. Oh, I I forgot to minus one. Yes, it's zero point zero three zero zero nine. Point three point zero zero nine. Absolutely, Doctor. There is just one uh, issue. Uh, yes. Now uh, we have one. I have one plus uh, Z four mm -hmm. power four is equal to one point one two. What what I should do with the four? Ah, okay. Four. So uh, you have to make power one divided by four. Yes. Well, uh, okay. okay. For so the you mean for the other side. Power four. Okay. Okay. Power quarter. Absolutely. Mm. So it will be uh, zero point zero three zero zero nine five. Very good. Now, the zero if we if we take off the one. One right? Then you have to multiply by two. Yeah, this is the semi-annual actually. Uh, good. Okay, if we want to find the annual, it will be 0 0.06019. Absolutely. So right. when you are when you do uh, uh, you know uh, this process, you will find the Z4. Now you will build the Z5 using the Z1 until the Z4 and so on. So you are building step by step the whole yield curve. Yes. So once we have done this, okay, now we can use these, you know, different spot rates or theoretical spot rates in order to find the right, uh, you know, uh, 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 fair price of the bonds. So we'll use each one of these spot rates as, you know, uh, as a discount, uh, uh, discount rate for specific specific you know period specific cash flows so we no longer will use uh, one discount rates for all the cash flows but we'll use uh, for each cash flow a specific discount rate this will be more accurate more realistic and it should allow us to find a more you know uh, uh, efficient fair price of the bond and once we have found efficient and efficient fair price of the bond we can undertake uh, an efficient you know, investment decision. Okay, guys? Yes, okay. Any question? I think so far so good, doctor, but we need to maybe after the, the class or the next class, we have to prepare a little bit just for the... Absolutely, so uh, I will ask you guys, so I'll give you an you know, assignment and we'll solve it, you know, uh, uh, during the next lecture, inshallah. So, sorry, you said ask what? Uh, to do an assignment. So it is just, you know, uh, uh, to put into practice what you have learned today, right? Okay. Doctor, can you please uh, send us an email regarding the details of the assignment? Absolutely. So we have just, uh, uh, we have right now two assignments, right? We have a written report regarding uh, the evolution of the, you know, uh, uh, the bonds market uh, following the last, the, you know, the last events of the coronavirus and the depression. Uh, and then we have the, this one. So I will propose you to exercise number 13, right? Okay. Exercise? Number 13. Which page? Sorry. Page 123 and 124. 123. Uh, doctor, uh, if you could send us an email for both these signs. I do. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, uh, but for, the, uh, for number 13, so all you have to do is just the, uh, you know, the A and the questions. So you skip the C, but the C is dealing about the forward rate which is not included with us uh, for this chapter. So just the A and the D. Okay. 
So anyway, I will send you, uh, you know, uh, an email as usual uh, with, you know, the uh, the required assignments and uh, the YouTube link for uh, today's lectures. Okay, guys. One more thing, Doctor. The yes. Uh, lecture for the previous class. Mm -hmm. We got the YouTube link, but the Excel file was not there. I no. think you forgot to put the Excel file. The Excel file, no. Uh, yes, uh, I sent it in, uh, uh, with the email, no? Yes. Just the video without the Excel sheet. Uh, so, uh, so you, you, you want the, the video with the, you know, uh, sorry, the Excel sheet with the video, with the YouTube link here? Yeah, yeah no. we thought we, we will send the Excel sheet with the video. I did it. No, I mean, email that the Excel file is below, but the file was not there. Really? I think you forgot to upload the file that happened. Maybe you didn't attach it. Mm -hmm. Maybe.